The following is an open discussion. There are four of us present. What we're going to cover today are some of the fundamentals of finding ourselves, of discovering what life is all about, of clearing away our personal problems. When doing this, there's only one place we can possibly start. There is no other way to start, no other correct way. This way to start is to see that we actually do have problems, that there are many things to clear away. This takes an intense self-honesty to see the condition that we are actually in, both personally and socially. Once having seen the problem, that is the first act of intelligence toward clearing it away. So our first, the first part of our discussion will be simply for all of us here in this room and those of you listening to the tape, please enter into it in your own way, in your own mind. Follow along with us. Our first part of our discussion will be to See the human problem as it is, and not pretend that everything is all right, because it isn't all right. With this honest first start, we can then take the second step of finding the cure, and that will enter into the talk, the discussion later on. So we do have problems, many of them that we don't mention to other people, not even to our husbands or wives or our best friends things that have held over from 20 or 30 years, things that frighten us, things that confuse us. Now, it is quite essential that we are not afraid to see the problem, see the very depths of it, and not be afraid of it, but simply to look at it. Just as a doctor would examine a patient as the first step toward giving him the cure. So let me ask, anyone in the room here now, to please discuss or comment in your own way to contribute to this first step of seeing that we do have problems. Simply comment comment on it in any way you like, either, either personally or something that you have observed. If we don't see we have a problem, we cannot go on. So let's take this first step rightly. Who would like to say something? I'll uh, start. One thing that I, I have experienced, or should I say that uh, I have become aware of, is a feeling of injustice from the past. That everybody mistreated me, uh, took advantage of me. I never did uh, get the things that I had coming to me, you know, good thing. Poor little me. And you know what? I enjoy that. I became aware that I like that. You know, that, that, that feeling there. I could not, uh, let it go. You know, I grab it and Excuse I me. Would keep it. You mean you enjoyed the feeling of feeling, uh, yeah. injustice? Sure. Maybe you could explain that more. Well, the idea of enjoying a feeling of injustice is a strange thought to a lot of people. What do you mean by that? Well, suppose uh, somebody ignore me. Hmm? Yeah. Well, I would run mental movies through my mind. You know, I add more to it. You know, of the injustice of it. I just would not let that thought go. I just keep, you know, running it over. Uh, should I say... Uh, trying to get even with the other person. Yes. Mm-hmm. And I did it over and over again. This is what I call enjoying it. I just kept running it at right. one time or the other. All right. So I finally decided and became aware that this was 
hurting me. In that way, yes. So as soon as I started looking at it and find out that I was uh, enjoying it too, I didn't think I was at first, but uh, it became pretty clear that I was enjoying it. A false enjoyment. Right, right. Mm-hmm. right. So it was painful seeing it. But little by little, I decided not to enjoy them. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's one thing I have experienced. So that was your one problem that you saw you had clearly and decided not to go along with it anymore. That's right. A feeling, think of the allied feelings to that. Uh, you, you had the feeling of injustice towards you. There are many other feelings, a feeling of, of persecution. And you know, every time life denies us what we want, we have that feeling of persecution and injustice. And this is the way most people live. Not every day, every day, if a person could only watch his reactions to what happens to him when he goes to work, in the home, talking to his friends or wherever, quite unconscious, quite unknown to himself, he has feelings of injustice, of being persecuted, and one negative emotion will always arouse another. If I want something from you, and you don't give it to me, look at all the wrong feelings that arouses, among others, the feeling of resentment. I feel that you should behave in the way that pleases me. Think think on the level of the simplest of logic, how illogical it is, that I should demand that you behave in a way that pleases me. It isn't even logical on, on the, the elementary grade of logic. You know, a person who demands things from other people never ever dream of how the situation could be reversed. For example, why is it you should always please me, but I never have any right to please you? That's Even that is elementary logic, and we don't even go into that. We're going way above that where we have no ideas at all of how you should treat me. If I'm depending on you to treat me in a way that pleases me, I'll ask Sally, why do I want you to please me in a certain way? What is there, let me rephrase that, what is there wrong in me that makes me demand that you behave the way I want you to? There's something wrong with me if I do this, very definitely. Tell me what's wrong. Do you understand? You're making a demand of me? Is that what yes, you Yes, I demand that you behave in some way. Anyway, just take any example you want. I demand that you uh, you be true to me, be loyal to me, or whatever. Mm-hmm. Or that you uh, flatter me. What is wrong with me having these demands on you? I mean, so we can... We're asking this so we don't live that way anymore. Because that is a terrible way to live. You mean you think you can control me? All right. Is that what one thing you think you can do? That I should be able to control you. Uh-huh. I may not, and I don't mm-hmm. really. Mm-hmm. I may put you in fear, mm-hmm. which is wrong, and therefore I seem to control you in that way. But that is all false, too. If I make you afraid, there's something the matter with me. Mm-hmm. Did you understand the question? I'll just review it. No, mm-hmm. I really Did you didn't. understand it, Juan, what I'm getting at? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Why yeah. do I make demands on anyone whatsoever? Put it that way. Well, the more demands that you that a person makes on uh, another person or a group of people or many people, the more frustrated they're going to be because there is no one that's going to uh, make their chief concern to please you. Right. And uh, so, the more demands that you send out to more individuals, the more that you are going to be frustrated and hurt over these demands that you keep making on others. Right. And back to uh, uh, what Juan was saying a while ago about these mental movies of negative emotions, I have had this brought so clear sometimes because I thought that perhaps I was the only one that thought about self-pity, revenge. Juan mentioned revenge, how we will run in our mind someone who has done an injustice to us 
and we picture all kinds of fantasies of how I can seek revenge against right, right. this person, and all it does is destroy ourselves. If we can bring this thing up to consciousness, yeah. examine this revenge, and see that it really hurts only ourselves, if we can look at it and just be conscious of it, that's all we have to do, and this brings out its its nothingness. Because uh, somewhere I read where all revenge is self-destructive. And the more we think about revenge and self-pity, the more we are not being aware of what we are doing in the current moment. And this is all important. Very good. Now, the worst, this is, what he just said is an excellent example of what we're, we've talked about so many times, that human beings live in a state of self-hypnosis. If I'm sitting here wanting revenge on anyone, on Bob, on anyone, I'm in a state of self-sleep on the level of thought. In other words, this is all thought operating. And this was brought out yesterday and just now by Bob. This is self-destructive. You imagine, you imagine a person who is burning with thoughts about revenge, about hostility. Can you imagine that he can see what he's doing himself? We don't see it. If we saw it, we would stop it right now. I'll repeat one of our favorite lines. No man consciously hurts himself. We hurt ourselves because we don't, we know not what we do. And to the degree that I hurt me, I hurt you, and I hurt you. The degree that I cease to injure myself, <coughs> to that degree I'll cease injuring you. I, I am my world. I'm free of myself, I'm free of you, which means I'm free of hurting you. I have to get to the point where I no longer get any false pleasure out of hurting you in any way. This is a lot harder to do than most people realize. Because we don't see it. We don't see how we actually are. We've never stood apart from ourselves and looked back and say, this is how I behaved 20 minutes ago with these other people. Instead, we're off on some other thing in another form of sleep. We never actually examine our behavior. To examine our behavior honestly and impartially is the beginning of ending self-defeating behavior. Yes, Juan. Uh, we can hurt uh, somebody, you know, by our behavior with a smile without realizing it. We can even say a joke or something like that, and we can hurt somebody. Of course, way back, we know we want to hurt that person, so we will say it with a smile. Right. Which means uh, we have to see uh, why we did it, see our mm -hmm. motives, see the reasons we do things and say things. And there will always be a, a bit of a shock the first time we see our real motive. You understand wherever we we give a phony motive for doing something, a phony motive, way back in our mind, and we'll know the real reason. This is what we have to get way deep down inside of us to see why we behave the way that we do. One thing, I won't go on very long here, but it's important to bring in, very important. One thing we are working on for ourselves while we're, when we are working on ourselves, is to get rid of that horrible state called fear. We're working right now, those of you listening to this tape, if you're working on yourself, if you're going along with us, with us here, trying to understand, applying it to yourself, you're beginning to get rid of all kinds of fears. And eventually, when you have understood the whole thing, all fears will go. There'll be no exceptions at all. And so do you see why this brings us back to the idea of self-honesty? A person who says he's not afraid of anything is obviously not being honest. So he cannot get out. Be very candid with yourself in seeing how many things you are afraid of. Whether it's financially or in human relations. There are many fears related to sex. Most of them push down because we are so confused about sex which could be just as clear as anything else. There'd be no problem, whatever, with other people. So, if 
if this did nothing else, and it does everything, it will eliminate all these anxieties and apprehensions that we have geared toward the future. You may think that everything is fine just now, but you're concerned what will happen to you tomorrow or next year. All that will go, because you won't be living in time anymore. You'll be living from yourself instead of from your acquired ideas about who you are. When all our acquired ideas are gone, we are free of it. Then there's only now, right now. Right now as you're sitting here listening to this tape. You could only see that the past has no hold on you at all. So let's take, go on from there. Let's take a second step. Excuse me, Sally, go ahead. Yes, I was going to mention one of my problems. Uh, one was trying to be nice to everyone and trying to help everyone, which is an impossible task because you're at the mercy of everyone. You, it's impossible to help each person who asks you. And after I started on this, I realized that my motive for, for doing it wasn't really to help others. It was to keep this image I had about myself of being a helper and being nice to everyone. Now, may, may I ask, when you did something for someone else, there was, was there not, something way deep inside of you that sensed that there was something wrong? Mm -hmm. Yes, there was. Because you were doing something because you had an image that this was the, this was being a good person, for example. And yet, there's something in you that, that said there's something wrong somewhere. And on top of that, you found that when you did things for people, uh, be very careful, don't leap to conclusions on this. When you did things for other people, you found very often that they didn't appreciate it or they uh, demanded more from you. So, putting everything together, you saw that the whole idea of doing other things, because it was the what you thought was the good thing to do, it was all wrong. And it always backfired on you in one way or another. All right. Did you want to say more about it? No, that's all. It's just that you really, I really resented it. But I wouldn't let myself see that. Right. There's guilt there? Mm hmm. You mean after you gave a, after you gave a gift, after you gave it, uh, you would see that uh, you didn't like it afterwards? Yes, uh -huh. that's an instance, uh huh. Yeah. Or if the other person doesn't appreciate what you give them, then you feel resentful that you have given them that. Right, right. So we get it to confirm an image of being a good person. You know that, that millions of human beings are trapped by this, by ideas that exterior behavior is goodness. It is not. It is not wrong to do something good on the exterior for another person. If you see a, a hungry man and you give him food, that in itself is not wrong. But have you ever watched yourself while you're doing something good to another person to see if you get a pleasure from it or a confirmation of a self-image of being a good person? If so, this is doing good without being good. And there's you, only Usually you want to make sure you have a big audience too. Right. While you're doing this right. good deed. Right. You see, you see it very commonly in newspapers and on television. Pardon me. Go ahead, Bruce. When I gave uh, somebody something, you know, anything, uh, I would give to those that uh, they needed pretty well off. For the ones that needed, I wouldn't uh, give them anything. Yes. Because on this other person's, I could, uh, I wanted something from them. While those other ones that were under me, well, I, I couldn't get nothing from them. So I wanted a reward from, uh, say, somebody that was a uh, millionaire or something like that. Some kind of a reward, right. even if it's nothing more than them liking you, That's right. thinking that you're a nice, nice mm -hmm. person and all that. All right. We've seen that we have problems. There's no question about that. So I've lived this way 20, 30, 40, 50 years with all these problems and with the pain of pretense in it, of pretending maybe that everything was all right, but secretly I see that it is not all right. 
All right. I have a problem. And let's further say that I have exhausted all my wrong answers. I've seen that simply going to church does absolutely nothing for me. I've seen that trying to be more successful, making more money, has done nothing for me. I still have nightmares. I've seen that even though I have a, a home and a, a nice wife or husband and a family, and I'm comfortable physically, I've seen that there's still this ache, this question, this fear. And I haven't said anything about it to anyone. For, for one thing, I sense that all my friends and my own relatives don't know any answers. I know they don't, because I know how frightened they are. I know how angry they get. I know what a nightmare their life is, just, just as mine is. And I'm faced with a, a tremendous problem right now, am I not? I don't know where to turn. I want to change. I don't want to live in these old ways anymore. But what am I going to do? Is there anything I can do? Is there any way out at all? Now I'll say this. There certainly is a way out. It exists. Many of you listening to this tape can find this way out. But you have to understand one thing above all. This is a very frank and open discussion. If I want to get out, I have to stop deceiving myself. If I started with that alone, that would be enough. That would be the beginning of the way out. You have to start finding this way out. First of all, I have to stop deceiving myself about many, many things. I have to stop being gullible. I have to stop thinking that the first person who comes along with an answer knows what he's talking about. May I make a suggestion? The next time someone gives you a book and says this will help you, the next time someone says, well watch this television, religious program on television, or come with me down to this philosophical discussion, you watch very, very carefully the person who gives you this invitation. I don't mean you pry into their personal life or anything like that. I mean, you look at their face. You look at the expression on their face. I want you to decide whether this person himself has found something. You watch his nervousness. You watch whether he becomes upset if you decline his invitation to go to the lecture or whatever. And if you find that this person has not found himself, which he probably hasn't, then that is reason enough not to accept the book or go to the lecture. Don't be gullible, for heaven's sake. Don't believe anything anyone tells you. You find out for yourself, and you are capable of finding out for yourself. Don't be so desperate for an answer that you will believe anyone, which the mass, the masses of human beings do. They're so desperate. They're swimming out in the sea in the fog, and they don't know what to do. And the first person who comes along and says, I can guide you toward the harbor, they find them. And they never get to the harbor, but they don't know it because they've covered it up with ideas of having the harbor already. May I also ask you this? Do you know the difference between decent behavior and hostile behavior? Of course you do. You watch these people who offer you ways out. And you be very honest with yourself to find out what their personal life is like, not their public life, not when they preach, not when they tell you about religious news. What is their private life like? You can tell. You don't have to go into their home to find out. You watch... You watch their eyes. You watch whether they're nervous. You watch flashes of indignation in their face. When you see that, you walk away. When you do that, you've taken the first step. By cutting yourself off from false teachings, from people who would use you and exploit you for their own egotistical needs. 
And every time you do this, you become a little more free, a little more independent. You know what you're doing? You're returning to your own original intelligence. And every one of you listening to this tape, every one of us in this room, without exception, has an original intelligence that was covered over and and shoved aside by our conditioning in our childhood and even going out into society today. We, we are bombarded with wrong ideas. Look, do this one thing and then I'll open it again. You dare, you dare to stand all alone. Don't you believe anything anyone tells you? Don't you do it. If you value your own life, if you don't, then you go out and believe anything you want. Believe anyone you want. But if you value your own life, if you value your, your own mental integrity, you refuse to listen to anyone. You know what this will do? This will make you very frightened at the start, won't it? Because you've depend, been depending on all these people who have been telling you what was right. Unconsciously, you may be living today by something you were told 30 or 40 years ago. Don't you see the results of following this teaching? What has it done for you? Be real honest when you're all alone with yourself. For example, when you're falling asleep and all these terrible thoughts go through your mind. That, that is what you were right. Now, if you, you want to break it, I will ask you. You want to get out of it? Start freeing yourself of all this nonsense and all this superstition and all these lies that have been imposed on you. And don't feel guilty about tossing them out. First step, be very honest, to stand all alone. Don't depend on anyone. Who would like to comment on it? <clears throat> well, as you said, Mr. Howard, we have to be independent. As we are just now, we accept invitations we really don't want to accept, but we go along with it uh, because we want to keep our friends. But we have to go against this and see... Ask ourselves, what do we value more? Is it freeing ourselves or is it holding on to these friends who keep us in this trap of uh, slavery? Right. So we go against, we go against this and uh, don't accept the invitations and not make, don't make excuses like we usually do. Don't apologize. That, this is what you. happens. You apologize and, uh, you know that this is just an excuse to please the other person right, so that right. you'll keep their friendship. Right. And then later on, as you said, you feel guilty. This is the cycle. So we have to uh, stand alone and just say, I can't do it. And that's all. No explanation. That's right. That's right. Don't, don't make their... This is important. I'll, I'll just throw it in fairly quickly. Don't make another person's problem, another person's neurosis, your problem. You don't owe their neurosis a thing. You owe your own self-awakening to yourself and nothing else. Because most people don't want to wake up. Do you really understand this? I hope those of you listening to this tape really understand this very deeply. If you do, it will save you a lot of problems in the future. The vast majority of human beings do not want the truth. They want illusions. They want excitements. They want someone to cling to. They want an organization where they can come together and be with friends. You have to let all that go. You have to walk away. You, you walk away. Look, if you are afraid of walking away from it all, I'll tell you what to do. You walk away while being afraid of walking away. Do it. Don't say, I'm not going to be afraid. You are afraid. Say, I'm going to walk away in fear and trembling. And you get up and you walk out of that room. You walk out of that auditorium. Or psychologically, at least. You may not be involved in social or physical activities like that. But you may be involved mentally. You get up and walk away being as scared as you are. Don't try not to be scared. You be scared and walk away and see what happens. You'll see something happen to you that's never happened before. Because not trying to escape your fear, you begin to understand it. 
and the very understanding of it is the escape from it. There, and there's no other escape. You stand there and shake if you want, but walk away. Somebody? Uh, our friends and husbands or wives, whoever is close to us, they do their utmost to keep us with them, not to let us go. They try to cling. And when this happens, sometimes we say, well, maybe I can make it. We go halfway with them. But this is wrong because you're putting yourself in, you're compromising. You're compromising with the truth. You have to make a clean break. Right. Psychologically, not oh, necessarily yes. physically. No, go ahead. Psychologically. Yeah, well, I was getting to what Sally's in here. Uh, once you decide to get out, away from your friends, Do not say anything about it. Do not blab. Because they will try to keep you where you at. They will do everything in their power. And since uh, wind out, we more like to go with them. So you want to get out, do it quietly. Go on your own without telling anybody about it. Because I had that experience, which it then stopped me, but they did a good job about it. You know, I'm trying to stop them. Well, I think this is real good advice uh, that both Sally and Juan have just given, because it's just real easy to get emotionally entangled with friends, uh, as Mr. Howard said, uh, with all their neuroses, and on a human level, it would be very easy to give your opinion of what they should do or what efforts they should make when really they don't want your advice anyhow, and they're not going to accept it. Uh, so as you say, Juan, it's probably good just to uh, disenchant yourself from these friends that you have and find this truth on your own, because... The more you stay with former friends who are pretty well mixed up and attempt to meet their problems on their level, the more this is going to hinder your progress. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. That's and very good. Excuse me, Mark. And we just go from uh, one trap to another one. You know, I still want my friends around that I'm saying that I'm I went out. Amen. Mm -hmm. yeah, yes, this is true. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? It is very difficult. Look, we understand. We understand the difficulty of breaking away, because our habits, the strength of habits, is our chains. We're saying this. There is always one small thing we can do to start breaking the first link in the chain. Start weakening it, at least. And one of these is, no matter how many people we may have involved in our life, whether it's a husband, wife, relatives, friends, to begin to work secretly, that word is all right, on our own, to begin to think for ourselves and not be so eager to listen to what other people say because it has already been pointed out a person who is lost has nothing whatever to give you but wrong directions. And this person giving you wrong directions can be very authoritative. He can have a reputation. He might be world famous. And if we're still gullible, if we're still weak, if we're still afraid to stand on our own, we'll listen. And you know what else we'll do? We'll resent anyone who tells us that this person is not telling us the truth because we've identified with him. Our self-interests have connected with him. And you take away, you know, when you take away a person's idol, he resents you and he becomes very frightened because this idol is all he has. So we're letting these things fall away through being so tired of paying the price 
that we don't want to pay the price anymore. So let's take a, another phase, another step toward finding the way out, which is to look at ourselves as we are instead of as we imagine we are. Which is always a surprise, a shock to us. Because if I have an ideal image of being a successful person and you criticize me or in exterior events takes away this image of being successful, I'm going to be shocked, am I not? Now, we're going to briefly to cover the idea of words and labels. Sally brought that up as a subject the other day. Words and labels are on the level of thought, of thinking. In other words, I think with labels, I think with words. So I label myself, what, anything at all, intelligent, successful, anything at all. Kind. Kind, generous, anything at all. Do you realize, look, look, look at this. This is the only thing in the world I have done is given myself a label. I've said that I am this kind. That doesn't make me kind. That doesn't make me really intelligent. That's just a word, a thought about myself. But having, having taken the word as the thing, which it is not, I begin to believe that I am this kind, generous, intelligent person. And woe unto anyone who contradicts this mere label. I'm going to interrupt myself by saying something else. Do you know what you have to do? If, if those of you who are listening to this tape, do you, may I ask you, those of you listening in this tape, wherever you might be, do you, do you really want out? Because I'll tell you how to get out in another way. Then we'll go back to words and labels again for a minute. To get out, you have to expose all your labels about yourself all your descriptions of yourself, of being this wonderful human being, which is phony, and you know it, and I know it, we all know it here, you have to expose them to destruction. Very fortunately for all of us, from the moment we get up in the morning, reality, to call it that, is trying to destroy these. I go out, with a, a nice image of being a, a very dynamic salesman or businessman. And I go out and I have a very bad day in my business. Do you know what reality is trying to tell me? Now look, you have to think. You have to think about these things. Do you know what reality is telling me? First of all, I feel bad that I had a bad day. And I'm a, I don't want to mention it to my wife or husband or whatever that I had a bad business day because I have an image of being successful. When I go home that night, I'm afraid because my image of, t you know, telling my wife that I had a bad day will be damaged because I've already said I'm successful. Or I'm running for public office and I say I can solve the world's problems, but, am I, but I'm defeated for office. Why do I feel bad? Because I have an image that I could solve the world's problem. I can't even solve my own. Now, here's what to do. This connects with words and labels, because I have labels of being a nice person, a kind person, as God said. All day long, reality is coming toward me and saying, you know something, you're really not nice. You, because you got angry when someone took your parking place down at the office. You're a kind person, but you got secretly angry at that person. Now, does an angry person, uh, uh, does a kind person get angry? Not at all. So you're really not nice. You're thinking uh, bad thoughts toward this person who took your parking place. Take little things. You can see little things. So all day long, reality is trying to straighten us out. What, what do we do that prevents us from being straightened out? We resist. We fight. We get angry at anyone who threatens to expose us as the phonies that we are. To the degree that I have the courage to let you and you and you destroy my phony self-descriptions, my flattering ideas about myself, to that degree will I become a healthy, whole human being. 
So the dropping of words and labels is the dropping of misery. It's that simple. It's really that simple. If I will have the courage, when I, when I get this defeat from the outer world that says you're really not as nice as you say you are, if I will have the courage to say, you know, that's right, I'm really not nice because I think all kind of thoughts that I don't tell you about. I smile when I don't like you and so on. I will have the courage to go through this operation, this major operation on my psychic self. I'll come out a whole and healthy human being. So do think about the idea of words and labels in connection with our self-work. And remember that words and labels are always created on the level of thought, of thinking. It's proper to have labels on their own practical use. If a, a can in the grocery store did not say peaches, we wouldn't be able to get peaches when we wanted it. If it had no label, we might get apricots instead. So labels are proper on their own level. We have names. Each of us has a name, so it's for ready identification. But when words and labels start telling us the kind of a person we are, that is when we get into trouble. Because they are not real at all. Reality, truth, freedom is above labels. Because it's above thought, which creates the labels. Is it, do you understand this? Yes. What do yeah. Go ahead, Juan. No, I have a question. Do you see the marvelous opportunity we have? Really? So every time I get pain, every time I get apprehensive, every time I get hostile and angry, I have a, I have an opportunity. Now, I'll ask one of you here. How's our time doing, Juan? All right. Oh, you got a, you got another minute. One minute? Yeah. All right. Now we'll just uh, put out the question which can be answered on the other side. Well, so one, one of you here, please tell me what is meant when I say you have an opportunity to free yourself whenever you see anger or disappointment in yourself. Think about that for a minute. And when we turn over the cassette tape, we'll go into it a little more. All right. Here to do one thing. But you can describe it in several ways. We're here to work on ourselves. We're here to change ourselves inwardly. We're here to become free and authentically happy human beings. To get out of our own trap. And a couple of minutes ago we brought up the idea of the great opportunity we have to change ourselves whenever we suffer a disappointment, a rejection. You know, if you reject me, that is a wonderful thing for me if I want to get out. Because I can see, first of all, that I suffer from feeling rejected by you. Why on earth do I suffer so much? I can look into it. I can find out why I suffer. If you, if you really see why you suffer, you won't suffer anymore. And I'll add a little extra thought here. Don't put any value whatever on suffering. Don't you dare get any pleasure from it. Most people do. Have you ever noticed, have you ever noticed how people enjoy their suffering? How they can hardly wait to tell you about their troubles? And have you ever observed them while they were telling you about how badly their husband or their wife or their friend mistreated them. You ever looked at them? They're having the time of their lives. This, again, is what is known as being asleep, as being under self-hypnosis, as being lost. This, again, is false pleasure. It's a false feeling of life. And that kind of a person has to pay the price for living that way. You know, when you get a, a false pleasure, you have to pay for it. It would be a very dreadful price. We have to get tired of paying the price. The original point was, I'll rephrase it this time. How can I, as a person who wants to set himself free, how can I use my very problems, my very pains, 
as tools for self-liberation. Someone comment on that, please. How? Let's let's take a specific, a very specific example. Something happens today where I get my feelings hurt. Anything at all, it makes no difference. And people get their feelings hurt all day long in one way or another. How can I use my hurt feelings to get rid of hurt feelings? Not just of this one incident, but totally, altogether. Well, Mr. Howard, you mentioned rejection a while ago. Why should we allow, because a friend might reject us at the moment, uh, why should this upset me? Well, this is understandable, because supposing ten friends rejected you all at once, because of maybe some foolishness, or maybe of some circumstance, life is a change after all, would this be any reason that we should go slit our throat, or would this be some reason that we should spend a week, or two weeks, or a month being completely dejected and completely depressed? Is this necessary? No. In other words, we are at the mercy of everyone with whom we come in contact. And when we are no longer at the mercy of other people's negative emotions, then we, in turn, will become healthy. Right. And do not allow someone else's negative emotion towards you or their rejection towards you influence your own thoughts because as they influence your thoughts if you allow this to happen to you then you become completely at the mercy of all your friends or a few of your friends or whatever you become their slave you become the slave of anyone who can upset you or reject you or say an unkind thing to you who who wants to be a slave i don't want to be a slave do you that's why we're here right now because we don't want to be slaves. Yes, one. On that, uh, about taking any event or anything on labels, our suffering, we keep our suffering. Uh, suppose I have an image of being real nice, nice person. So this other person uh, rejects me. He might not even be rejecting me. In other words, he probably has something else to do. Hmm? Mm-hmm. Okay. So he might uh, say, well, I can't go out with you today. I have something else to do or something, which he probably has. Right. Huh? Right. But my mind won't see that. Hmm? My mind will say, ignore me. Personal he rejection. Yeah. He doesn't, uh, doesn't he know that I'm very nice? Yeah. I never re- reject him. Yeah. I never ignore him. Yeah. But if I look a little deeper, I will find out that I do the same thing. Right. right. But I never see that contradiction. Right. Or else, right. I don't want to see it. It's there, but uh, I don't want to see it. I'd rather blame another guy than uh, bring it to my own attention and see that I am the same way. That we do to other people the same thing we condemn them for doing to us. But we, as you say, we don't see the contradiction. There's a wall in our mind, a a yard thick, Mm -hmm. that prevents us from seeing it. But when we see that we do the same thing to others that we condemn them for, that, again, at the beginning, as Bob said, of mental health. Mm -hmm. We've taken down the wall, and that also ends what is known as self-righteous hypocrisy, too. All right. Let's take Sally. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Howard, I have a label say of being efficient. And yeah. my supervisor points out to me one day that a lot of mistakes have been made in typing. And so I flare up. <clears throat> I either say she also makes mistakes, or I say, oh, well, this was, I wasn't feeling well this day. I either attack her or defend myself. Now, if I'm working on myself, instead of doing either one, I'll see the fact that I did make a mistake, and uh, my self-image of being efficient will have been broken a little bit. Very good. If yeah. I 
see it. Very good. Very good. You're seeing the fact. Mm -hmm. You see what you have done that is very valuable? You're not defending a self-image of whatever your image would be, of being mm -hmm. very efficient. You see? Mm -hmm. If you don't have an image of being uh, efficient, and someone catches you in being inefficient, there's no problem. You say, that is, that is right. And by the way, there's a little extra benefit here. Then you do become more efficient because you've acknowledged it instead of lying about it. You see? become a, yes. more alert sure. to what, whatever you're, you're doing. This is why your everyday tasks become far easier, far more efficient. You, you do much better daily work when you become a whole person because your mind is not being distracted left and right by all the, these emotional outbursts that we have within ourselves that take us away from our typing and from our driving, you'll become a better driver of your car. Mm -hmm. Because you'll be able to give your attention to it instead of being carried away. See, mm -hmm. what happens is that our minds get kidnapped all day long by negative thoughts. We're carried away. This is the cause of many automobile accidents, accidents in the home, anything at all. So we become one with ourselves. Clear, yes. Uh, yes, Mr. Howard, I have actually experienced that. Before working, and a mistake was pointed out to me, I would worry about it. How did it happen? And recently I've noticed when a mistake, when anything's pointed out, I get to correcting it right away without any thought. Without self-defense of any kind. Do you see the... Now, you say you have done this, okay. and I know you have. Do you see the, the, the freedom and ease that uh -huh. it gives you? Look. If I'm not fighting, what what am I? What state am I in? I'm in the state of you want to use the word peace, quietness. If I'm not fighting, I'm at peace. Let's bring up another idea on this very important, one. and we'll connect this with rejection. Because this again is a, a feeling that people experience all day long. Now you think about this. Those of you in this room have studied these things quite a while now, and you think about this. And those of you listening to the tape, think about it too. Connect it with perhaps what you've already understood. When I get rejected by someone, or by an event, a rejection in the sense that this event does not re come out the way I wanted it to, when I get rejected by an individual, or by life in general, let me ask you a question. Who gets rejected? Stop and think. Don't answer quickly. Stop and think for a minute. Bringing into everything you've learned already. Who gets rejected? Our ideas of ourselves. Our false idea of ourselves. Very good. Right. False notions. Our false notions are being destroyed, attacked. Mm -hmm. And that's just like exactly like Bob said. Then if you see this, then, then what happens? Suppose I see, I have an image. I have an image of being popular, alright? I'm very popular, let's say. All of a sudden something happens that I find out I'm not so popular anymore. Maybe uh, my best friends leave me. Something happens, I'm no longer popular. But I've been studying. I've been working because I don't want to live in pain anymore. And I see through the idea that what was rejected was simply an idea I have of myself. What really happens, what really happens is that nothing happens anymore except an understanding. If I don't arouse by my wrong thinking a neurotic reaction, then what is there left? There's a, a, a nothing, a nothingness there. It's simply a quietness and understanding. So everything depends upon me understanding the whole thing. Then you can, then you see, you see what happens? Then life, people, life in general, can treat me any way it wants, and I remain untouched. <clears throat> this does not mean I'm uninvolved. I may be, I may go out and work ten hours a day at my business. I may be involved with hundreds of people every day. I may be in many things in order to earn a living, or maybe uh, involved with relatives or things like that. But because I have freed myself. I don't have any problems anymore because I'm not trying to prove anything. Where there are no images, there are no problems. But we have to see that we're living from images. Yes, Swan. That's a that's a good point there. Uh, that we have to be involved in life, you know, but without those images. 
But some of us might take the wrong thing and think we're going to have to escape, get by ourselves, become a hermit, or something like that. That's just another es- escape, isn't it? And another escape, thing. Yeah. right. Yeah. No, we have to be right in the middle of it, but we saw those images. Right in the middle of the battle. Don't run away right. from the battle. And without demands, whenever we have a demand or a desire for the event to turn up as we feel we want it to, and it doesn't, it conflicts with our desire, this is when we're in trouble. This is when I have been in trouble time and again, when I expect a result turn out the way I want it to turn out, and it doesn't. So what's the big deal? All right, Bob, you explain, you explain this. Go back a little bit. What is making this demand that an event turn out the way you want it? Let's track it back just to be helpful to people. Well, this false eye that is not unified, this sense of that I have of myself as being a, as you were saying a while ago, a very kind, a very generous, a very honorable person wants this honorable event to turn out the way I want it to, when it must turn out the way it must in reality. And it doesn't, events don't always turn out the way we want them to, and I'm not going to be completely at the mercy of every event that doesn't turn out, I'm not going to be at its mercy. Right, right. In other words, Bob, uh, you're trying to say that we don't, uh, you're finding out, and I'm finding out, that we don't have control over things. Things just happen the way they're supposed to happen. Right. But this thing here, shall we call it uh, an image or whatever we want to call it, wants to control things. And yet we see every day that reality tells us, no, you don't have no control over anything. This is what uh, amounts to, right? I think that's right. The more the more I can cut down my demand that a specific instant turn out the way I want it to, the better off the real self will be. And when we don't demand anything, there's nothing to fight, nothing, nothing to, to resist. Fight. Right, nothing to fight. And you can see how vain we are to think that things should turn out the way we want them. Right, right. You know what? Pro- oh, just briefly. Did you say more, Sally? No, that's fine. There's a great deal of, of vanity, and vanity holds the I in place, that I am a separate self apart from the world who can control. So if we can just see our vanity, that would be a good start. Just see vanity. Now, yes? That uh, is part of the problem we have of trying to help others, you know, that we can help others. In other words, that we can do something. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that's one of the big delusions we have to get over, and, and Sally brought this out earlier in the discussion. We have to get over the idea that we are a savior, sort of a minor savior of other people. You, you know that most people don't want your help, they don't want your saving. Even even if it was right or wrong, most people don't want advice. They don't want to know the way out. They're comfortable in their prison cell, which they call a mansion, of course. It's all decorated, so they don't they don't let themselves see that it's a cell. They put a label on it. They put a word on it. They call it a mansion. So what a relief this is to us. One of the re- many reliefs we get along the way is to see that we are not compelled to go out and save the world. And, you know, one of the things happens to us at a certain stage and maybe we smile a little bit and see how foolish we were when we used to give all this profound advice, all this profound political advice, religious advice, social advice. See how humiliating the way is? See that humiliation is helped. Humiliation which is not refused. When I accept humiliation 100%, what happens? I end an illusion about myself, which means I no longer have to pay the price. It means I'll 
you see what happens? Eventually, there is never again such a thing as humiliation if you go all the way to the end of it. How can there be? How can there be humili- humiliation if there is no phony self-image to be punching? When we're not thinking about who we are, but are simply ourselves, no labels, no words, how can you hurt me? How can you reject me? There's no one there to be rejected. This this is hard work, isn't it? Mm-hmm. But but you understand it. I know you do. However, it's easier than trying to please everyone. Oh, this becomes a terrible pit in uh-huh. which we're engrossed, doesn't it? It does. Because there's no end to it. And Mr. Howard getting back to being a helping person. In those days I found that I really enjoyed it when people did need help because this gave me my feeling of myself. Being important for them. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When I ask uh, somebody for advice, I already had it in my mind uh, what what the answer would be. <laughs> he had to confirm this answer. If it didn't, he was right. out. Right, right. Mm-hmm. This is what I wanted from him. Yes. Let's have a comment or two on another basic principle. We're covering basic things here. Self-images, self-honesty, other topics. Let's think a little bit about the idea of simple persistence. Of simply sticking with this. You, do you know that when a person comes to a group, perhaps this group that uh, you folks are in who are listening to this talk, when a group of people come together to hear a discussion about truthful principles, they have to make a tremendous decision when they leave that room, when they leave that lecture hall, wherever it might be. Because the truth brings out the very best or the very worst in us depending on whether we want it or not, depending on whether we're ready for it or not. The reactions of people when hearing the truth are many and varied. Some people are actively hostile, and you know why, don't you? When my images are attacked by the truth, I'm going to get pretty angry at you, and I'm going to get away from you, and I'm not going to come around you anymore, because I feel threatened by you. Which, if we could see through that much, it would be a big help, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Some people are bored. Do you know why they're bored? Because of this block that we said people have in their mind, this yard-thick cement wall. Because the truth itself can't penetrate and give its own excitement, people get bored. Or they say, you know what they commonly say? People have said this to me. They say, well, I've heard everything you've said before. I know everything you're talking about. And they go right out of there, back to their misery, back to their hostility, back to their despair, back to their fears of being rejected. Don't ever say, I've already heard that before. You may have heard the words before, it's quite possible. But have you lived them? Have you gone into it? Have you gone through the humiliation of seeing that you don't know what you're talking about and never did, regardless of all your college degrees and how much fame you have? So, those of you listening to this tape, as you're sitting listening to it, ask yourself what your reactions are up to this point. Just do this. What have been my reactions up to this point? Just look at them. Now I will tell you this. Everything you have heard today has been the truth. You're not getting any self-deception in this group, I assure you of that. You're not getting flattered. You're not being told what you want to hear. You're getting the pure truth. Now you have to make a decision as whether you want it or not. And the course of your life from this day on depends on whether you accept it or not, whether you go along with it or not. Even if you're afraid of what you've heard, may I tell you something? Many of you are afraid, those of you listening to this tape, many of you are afraid of what you heard. Now I'll tell you that you must ignore this fear completely. Don't you listen to it. This is the way you've lived all your life, and this is what has made your life what it is. Do you want to change or don't you? It's up to you. Even if you are afraid of what you heard, you stick with it. You be persistent with these things. If you get frightened about what you've heard, 
And I know you have. I can't be deceived by this. I know you've been frightened. I'll tell you what to do if you if there's one ounce of desire in you to get out of your own trap. You come back. You come back and listen again. You come back and work with it. You come back you come back and see even more how frightened you are. That is good. You see how you're scared of the truth is help. To deny it is unhelp. So the idea of persistence is very important in all our work. And you can persist in many ways. There are many, many work projects you can take. Reading the right books, for example. Getting knowledge. Books. The purpose of books is to provide you with certain knowledge. The purpose of this tape, part of the purpose of it, is to give you certain knowledge which is necessary. Then having gained this knowledge, you must, while keeping the knowledge, go beyond identification with it. Do you understand what that means? It means, look, it's very easy to read books and to get a lot of facts stuffed into your mind. And then it becomes very easy to say, I know, just because you know the facts. To know the facts is not to live them. You, Those of you listening may ask you, do you know people who are considered intellectuals who may have a good deal of knowledge about religion or philosophy and you know that inwardly they're very frightened human beings that means they know the words but have none of the music we want to persist to get to the point where we see after knowledge comes another step and I'll tell you what it is after knowledge comes the very important step of dying to identification with knowledge it's been likened to taking a boat across the river, but once you get across the river, you don't carry the boat with you, you leave it there. This does not mean you forget your knowledge, but it means you go beyond the point where you get, for example, vanity, a good deal of pride and vanity out of having this knowledge. You know, I know a lot of people who have studied these things, and they have become preachers or teachers, and you know that they haven't changed themselves one bit do you know that I can still see fear and anxiety in their faces? Do you know that I know they're hiding things from themselves? So, we have to go beyond all that. Yes, Juan, how long do we have? Uh, we have another few minutes. Right. Two minutes? No, we've got uh, a few minutes. A few minutes. Yeah. Okay. So, someone, yes, Juan has something. Go ahead. Yeah, Mr. Howard, I uh, think what you're getting at. I used to quote the Bible and try to teach others about it, you know. I had memorized the New Testament and I thought I knew, I knew the words, you're right. And I tried to tell others, you know, give them advice to be good and all that. But inwardly, I was very frightened. Right. This is what you're getting at. I know this is what you're getting. I was very afraid, and I want the other ones to agree with me, approve with me of what I was trying to give them out. So I see your point on that. So, in other words, you persisted beyond right. that point. See, it, you know, there's a great deal of ego gratification in giving advice to others, to telling other people how to live. I get a great deal of vanity out of it. You get a vanity out of telling other people how to live, if we're still trapped, that is. But we have to give that up, do we not? Because that is also giving us a sense of self. We have to give up any pride of being an authority in order to get out of the trap, because that's just another chain to want to tell others how to live. And we haven't even found out ourselves. Yes? This is actually what I wanted. I wanted others to say, boy, that... Uh that one really knows what he's talking about. <laughs> yeah. Actually, what I wanted. Right, right. But not that I knew anything inside of me. I was still just as frightened as anybody else. Mm -hmm. Let's cover a point that was made outside of these tapes, which is included in persistence. Everything is included in persistence. We're working all day long. And that's the idea of interrupting our daily thoughts. All day long you were thinking, are you not? Whether you're at work, you're at home, walking down the sidewalk. 
practice this technique, if you want to call it that. Wherever you might be, whatever you're thinking about, and this, unless it's a, something that you have to think about for, so to avoid an accident, don't think about this if you're running a machine, a uh, drill press in a shop, or driving your automobile in heavy traffic. But when you don't have anything particular to think about, simply interrupt your thoughts. Give yourself a joke. You know, it's very comfortable to run along in mechanical thoughts. Just just flow with the stream. It's very comfortable to live in daydreams, for example. Part of your persistent self-work is to catch yourself in a daydream, a mental movie, and say, I'm going to interrupt it, break it up. You won't want to do this, because it does give you this little bit of shock. But when you do this, you have taken the first step towards seeing the difference between mechanical thought and living above mechanical thought, which you can call consciousness, understanding, call it what you want. You must see the difference between mechanical thought and consciousness, which is above thought, which is not thought. When you live in thought, only where it is necessary, I need thought to know how to drive home, or I wouldn't know where I live. You need thought to cook your dinner. You need thought to conduct your business, whatever. I mean, great, fine, no problem there. Wherever you're not in practical thought, you should be in a free mind that doesn't even have practical thought in it, consciousness. And where there's no problems, what we're saying is this. Don't be in negative thought. Now, what's the first step of being out of negative thought? Seeing that you are. All right. You uh, you went to work this morning at 8 o'clock. About 9 o'clock, something happened that upset you. Uh, a paper that put on your desk that says uh, this was incorrect, you should have known better, please do your work, anything. Mm-hmm. Or someone criticized you. All right. What happens to you? Have you ever have you ever watched your reactions to a simple little thing like that? You know what happens, don't you? And I know. You went into negativity. You felt attacked. And what did you do next? You disliked the person who criticized you. Maybe this other person is uh, a mixed up person, and he almost certainly is, but that's beside the point. That's his problem. That's her problem. So you go into negative mechanical thought which, by the way, disturbs your efficiency of the work on your desk, but we won't go into that now. So what do you have to do? You have to break that negative thought instead of enjoying the negativity of it by disliking this other person or by feeling depressed. Don't you dare enjoy feeling depressed. You. That sounds strange to you that people enjoy being depressed. Let me tell you, they're having a great time sitting there thinking about poor little me about how this terrible world has treated precious me who nobody appreciates. Huh. So, you're going to break the pleasure of mechanical negative thought, which will be difficult, because there's great false pleasure in running along with it. You're breaking the mental movie. You pra- Now, I'll just summarize this. You practice breaking this. And you, if, you know what will happen, if I may put it this way, it'll be a little a little circle of light back in your mind that you've never ever seen before. Because you begin to see the possibility of living in a totally new way in this insane world. You'll see the possibility of you being a totally sane human being right in the middle of this insane world. You you can't run away from it. Don't run away from it. Use it. Be smart and use it. Then every time you break mechanical thought, simply to look at it, when you're looking at it, you're not it anymore. When you're caught in mechanical thought, that is what you are at the moment. How can you stand outside of it? You are it. But you can look back a second later and say, that's that's right. That's what I want to do. I want to break this mechanical negativity. <coughs> and every time you do this, you're beginning, you know what you're doing? You're beginning to find a a totally new life for yourself. You're beginning to really change the kind of a human being you are here on earth. (laughs) And you'll be all alone in this, except for the few who really want out too. So as I think it was Juan said, don't mention it to anyone. Don't you dare talk about these things. Don't cast your pearls before swine. 
swine being those people who are not ready for it, who don't want it. When you give the truth to people who don't want it, you're making a mistake. So do persist in interrupting mechanical thought, mechanical habits all day long. Watch what happens. Something new will happen to you. Who would like to comment? Uh, Mr. Howard, see what happens when you do let this little insignificant event, if you're not working, see what happens. Your whole day is ruined. Right. Uh, you're worried, you're depressed, you get angry. A whole stream of negative emotions from the, uh, the, the moment you got angry at this thing on your desk. Yeah. And this has set the pattern for your whole day. Right. Whereas right. if you interrupt, it can change it. You've broken the, the right, pattern. You've broken it. Yes. Say a, say a word, if you would, Sally, uh, about uh, starting your day right. You commented on that before. Uh, well, I think it's very helpful to read in the morning and have a name for the day. Uh, say, for instance, just a small aim helps very much. Say, for instance, um, this thing on your desk, if some, say you have a name not to get angry. Right. Okay, okay you, Understand sometimes, right. right. You have this aim, so you watch it in yourself, you watch it in other people, and you write down all the things you know about anger before you start the day. And this has set the pattern for concentrating on anger, wherever you see it. And then when you come home that evening, you add to this paper you have written on all the things that you have learned uh -huh. about anger. Right. And right. this increases your knowledge and right. your being. Right. right. For example, you know, for example, seeing, you know, people who don't want these things will never believe these things we're saying, but we might be very shocked to see that we get angry 20, 25, 30 times a day. We've never seen it. The slightest thing. Mm -hmm. Example, the simplest example, you're expecting an important letter that's very valuable to you, either socially or financially. You're expecting the letter, and you're looking for the mailman. You're watching for him, and you see him drive right by or walk right by your mailbox. You watch your anger at this. There is anger there, and don't say there isn't. There's anger because an event out there has denied what you wanted. Now, multiply this about 20, 25 times a day, and see how often, or just... You know one of the worst kinds of anger? This low grade grinding anger that is there all the time, that is not necessarily aroused by any particular incident, but it's just there, just as a as a general mood. If we could see that, if we could see a mood that we're in, not an angry mood, a person would say. Secret uh, resentment is always there. Yeah. We can look at it. It's yeah. always there. Yeah. For instance, I went to I went to the store and I bought something, came back, and right away I found out that I forgot an item. Yes. So my mind started saying, you can get it tomorrow or the next day. Or, so. so I said, no, I'm going back right now and get it, even if I have, if I have to wait in line. Yeah. So there was a resentment right there. Yes. Right. 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 It was right there. You caught it. Right. Yeah. You saw right. it. That's very good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is, has many connections, you know. Well, well here's another way yeah. life is treating right. me. And, I understand. You know, I understand. Yeah. It's the little things, Sally said. It's the little, if we can catch a little thing, and if we can see that we can actually change a little thing, look how encouraging that is. Right encouragement. There's, there's encouragement in this work all the time. And the best encouragement is to actually see yourself change in a small way before your eyes. You mentioned that, Sally, the other day, or perhaps on the other tape, that you saw that you didn't have the usual reaction you had to a situation. This is a tremendous thing. Did you know if you can change in ABC, you can change in XYZ, and indeed you can. Look, look, this is total change, absolute. I'm not giving you words. This is a fact. You, you have to be intensely interested in this. If you want to change, you can. Really change. But don't talk about change as if you're changing. Because now you're just using words and descriptions. And this is self-deception. We, we have to, most people have to go through the stage of deceiving themselves. 
What will you give up? That's the question I'll ask you. What will you give up today that you are taking as valuable, that has no value to you at all? In fact, it is destroying you. You find something. So, again, a little thing. I'll, I'll, shall I give one? Yeah, I'll give one. Sure. When you're out with people, can you watch your conversations with your, with other people? And can you see how your conversation is hurting you? How you're damaging yourself? We talked about self-defeating behavior. Can you see how you have an, a compulsive need to talk and that you can't stop talking? Can you see that much? Yeah. See? Or can you see that you have a need to criticize? Look at that for a minute. If I have a need to criticize anything or anybody, if it's a habit with me, why? It's because I'm still trying to prove that I am right and you are wrong. Who is this phony individual who's trying to prove he's right? He's a big faker. And inwardly, he knows it. So, by observing my conversation habits alone, I can see dozens of valuable things about myself. Then, having seen them, can I say, I'm going to simply drop it. Look, you don't have to think about dropping them. Don't think about it. Just drop it right now. Say, for example, I'm going to cease to be such a blabbermouth. That is my particular problem, your particular problem. Or say, I'm going to go against the habit of being critical, of having a critical spirit. You, you know, by the way, do you not, that when a person has a negativity, a fault, that they always give it a flattering label. I knew a lady one time who was very rude. This is what, that's all I could describe. She's very rude to other people. Said very blunt things. And you know what, how she justified it? She said, I'm a very frank person who believes in speaking my mind. She was getting ego gratification out of calling herself a frank person. She wasn't frank. She was very rude and very unkind. Do you think you could tell her that? Boy, you, you open your mouth and, and watch her, her kindly expression change. She's going to hate you. We, this is what we want to get out of. All this. How many minutes do we have left, Juan? So we'll know. Well, we've got another five or six minutes. Who would like to contribute something? Anyone? Or should I make another turn? Well, Mr. Howard, not only being a critical person, but also when you're with others, watch how we agree with them so that they will like us. That's good. This is something I used to do a lot. I agree with them. And the motive was so that they would like me, so that I would still have friends. Why don't you cover that a little bit, Sally? Why? Uh, I know how strange this sounds, but we're, we're going into it. Why do you want to be liked? Do you understand the kind of, I put it in an odd way, but deliberately. Why do you need to be liked? Well, this gives my false self a feeling of, um, uh, I, I of want, existing. of existing, yeah. right, I oh, want to be safe and important yeah. to other people, and that all stems from vanity, doesn't it? Yes, vanity. I want to be needed. Right. Right, right. Yes. Uh, I think that also, I'm pleading mm -hmm. to the world to tell me who I am. Pleading, yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Tell me who I am. That's right. I don't know who I am, so I want somebody else to tell me. That is what determines who your friends are. Do you know who your friends are? Your friends are the people who confirm your phony self-images about yourself. Your enemies are people who don't believe them in them, who oppose your self-images. Do you know that this is how, what friendship is? It's nothing more than this. We associate with people who agree with us, as Sally said, who confirm our false images about ourselves. And if you... If you destroy my image or challenge it or injure it, you're not my friend anymore. I'm all afraid of you. I become hostile toward you. And by the way, my hostility toward you is another image going into place that I'm a person who can, who can be firm with people when necessary for them. There's no end to the tricks that a, a mind living in illusion will play on us. Stop, but I uh, brought that in. This is what judges most people's friendships. This is why, the, the, in, when you start to work on yourself, your best friends are your enemies. People who cause you trouble, which does not mean you live with them necessarily, stay around them. Because they are helping you to see how much anger you have in yourself. 
See, a man who's very, with a critical spirit can be of great value to you in waking up because he's going to arouse in you all this latent hostility that you didn't even know you have. So you see it. He says something. You see your hostility, but you're observing. You work it. And you say, you know, I'm really a, I have far more hatred in me than I thought I had. Now you're working. And you're beginning to end hatred, by the way. You'll never end it if you don't admit that you have it. So, so expose yourself to destruction. You understand? The destruction of false ideas about yourself. Let anybody welcome it and stay humiliated. You watch how you change. We'll end it with that.